second uh, year that we did the training here. It was 2000 and 2010. 2010. And we have, that was the beginning of a fun and successful professional relationship that he'll tell you a bit about. All right, you ready? Yeah. Can, I, I think uh, we're getting new batteries in the microphone, but you'll be without it for a while. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm very honored about uh, being here today with you. Um, I feel grateful uh, that to Wild Cocranus work, which was very inspiring for my profession. And uh, I'm grateful to, to Karen and Lynn that uh, uh, helped me trip about learning the model and the fundamental of the model and uh, uh, organizing with me uh, five Italian trainings during these years, uh, three Spanish trainings and uh, some other stuff I will tell you about. Uh, another thing I want to say to you is that uh, I apologize for my English and uh, if uh, something I say uh, doesn't make sense, please make some sign or <laughs> make me repeat because um, I'm not sure if it's understandable. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. 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 It's no different. You have to talk at the way. Get close. Let's go. Kiss it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's adjustable. Is it? Is it I don't know. Yeah, it's not. Okay, I'm going to try. <laughs> so, um, the presentation is uh, was uh, in uh, three parts, uh, but I, I don't know because I know we are a little late uh, and we cannot be late for lunch, so I will try to run, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't want you to... Uh, I, I want you to have lunch. <laughs> and, and myself, I'm Italian, so. <laughs> um, the first part uh, is a brief presentation of what uh, we did during this year with Karen and uh, Lynn, so some picture about the trainings and some stories about them. Uh, the second part is some theoretical uh, thinking about uh, the way a phenomenological existentialist approach uh, works uh, with uh, managing loss and grief. So some uh, theory, hope it will not be boring. And uh, then uh, the, the topic of the Congress, which is what to do with the kid. So some tip about uh, uh, working with parents, managing loss, which is uh, somehow has become during the year one of my main uh, specialization. I, I don't know why, but I often work in private practice uh, with uh, uh, severe loss, uh, like uh, parents' uh, suicide uh, and uh, the death of the little brothers and so on. So heavy, heavy loss to manage, especially for children. So uh, the last part will be, uh, I hope, uh, a little demo about a technique I use in which I mixed uh, uh, violence work with uh, MLP Classic, which is Timeline. So I hope I will show it to you because it is the fastest way to get used to, to techniques. So I will ask some of you to volunteer. I don't know if this is the right word because someone must come. So. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the first part and uh, uh, this is where it all started. This is my teacher with, uh, with, Violet. with, with Violet. At the time we were much Younger, yeah, I don't know if it's kind to say, but um, and this is what our group. It was an outstanding experience. Violet was present in an afternoon, I remember, and uh, I don't know if I have to say, it, but another thing I like of the trainings in the children's psychotherapy is that usually there are a lot of women. Uh, and just, <laughs> well, I, I'm always married, so it's not. <laughs> in Italy, usually we have one male in a, in a large group of females, so somehow it's interesting too. This, uh, this is 
a, a particular picture I wanted to show you because uh, this uh, is a party we had uh, uh, on the beach in Malibu and uh, you can see me and Lynn Stadler talking about, uh, well, uh, how does it uh, feel to organize something like this uh, in Italy? Well, we, we will think about it and the result was this one. In 2012, we did a two days congress. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Where she, she did an uh, insane uh, demo uh, with the five years old. It was amazing, really. Uh, we organized this two days congress with uh, 300 therapists from all around Italy, with some of the most well-known the therapists in Italy and Lynn came to do his presentation and four demos, if I remember correctly. This is you. Through that day. And uh, in, in the picture you can see talking Paolo Baiocchi, which I want to remember because uh, uh, he's the one that organized the Congress and uh, helped me organize the training, so I want to thank Paolo, because without Paolo, uh, this would, would not be possible at all. And uh, this is our first training in Bologna, 2012. As I told you, just one mail. Yeah, but uh, we are the, the teachers, so <laughs> it doesn't count. <laughs> And uh, okay, so this is what the first year we did a, a one year training in uh, four parts. It was uh, really a really nice group. Uh, we organized uh, after to promote the trainings uh, with a specific workshop in a calendar model in uh, a residential training that we have in the south of Italy, which involves most of the Gestalt Institute in Italy. This is our picture. This is a picture from uh, the workshop we did, and this is a picture I know Violet liked because you liked it on Facebook. So I, I know you, <laughs> I know you liked this one. Uh, this is uh, people with their uh, demons uh, from Demons book made of, made out of clay. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a, a big Gestalt Congress in Italy, with every Gestalt Institute in Italy, in which uh, 100 professionals saw a brief introduction to Oakland model, and we promote the training, so it was also a, a marketing thing. Um, and this is the second year in Venice. Yeah. Do you remember all of this? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is me and Karen, with this amazing group. And I don't have to say anything about uh, what we already know. And, <laughs> and I remember also that we have uh, this huge amount of clay in my suitcase that I wanted oh, no. to, to um, uh, take back home. And then uh, uh, during the trip on Venice uh, bridges, I broke the wheels of the suitcase. So it was a total nightmare, and we never organized another training in Venice <laughs> because of the trauma. <laughs> uh, this is the, the Venice training, uh, one uh, drawing of both in the store that many of you know. This is the second congress in Mestre near Venice where Lynn teaches uh, about uh, uh, parenting. And then the train moved to Trieste, northeast of Italy. This is the first training in Trieste. Um, people are watching, uh, I think this is making lemonade, mm -hmm. uh, the anger work part. This is the first training we did in Barcelona, thanks to Juan Carlos Lazaro and maybe Natalia, you are in the picture, okay, great. So Natalia was in, in this group, and uh, so the trainings became two. This is another workshop uh, I did to promote uh, the training. This is uh, Turin. Uh, we, we always had uh, sold out for Violet's work, so people are very, very interested about uh, effective ways to work with children in the start. 
and uh, you see people taking notes and my PowerPoint, but you can also see, the, I think, a pink balloon, uh, which is not from Penny White or from it, but it was some contact exercise I did with the group before talking too much. This is the second Trieste training. One May. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the third congress we organized in Trieste with about uh, 100 psychologists. This is Lane doing a demo. Second year in uh, Barcelona, a huge group where Natalia was still present. I can see. Yeah, I can see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is uh, uh, another congress in uh, Sicily this time. Uh, there, there were just a, a brief workshop, a brief workshop, uh, only 20 person per, per workshop was admitted. And uh, still people trying to enter the room uh, even without uh, booking the workshops of the world. There, there was a lot of interest about it. Uh, this is a brief uh, uh, introduction training I did in Lisbon to open uh, the possibility to call Lynn and Karen to do a training I did in May in 2017. This is the part of the group uh, to people missing. It was very fun. Uh, <coughs> okay, last training we did in Trieste. I don't know if it will be the last time we will work together in Trieste, but who knows? So this is the, the last group in Italy and the last group in Spain. This is my part uh, of the training about uh, loss and grief. And we were in a room, uh, you remember that, in a room uh, underground without any windows. So it was not so great to work in, but somehow appropriate with, about working with loss. <laughs> so, thanks again because uh, uh, especially Lynn and Karen trained, uh, I, I, I counted uh, I think more than 150 therapists uh, in Italy and Spain. So, great work uh, and uh, I really hope it will continue. This is a special effect. I did a photo, a picture of today. Um, so uh, now we will see if we can uh, continue organizing things, and we, we will talk in, in these days. But uh, we we know we we already know that Lynn will be in Naples in June. <coughs> I am teaching in Trento, in north uh, of Italy, in June, and Karen is coming in September, right, in Bologna. So we are conquering the territory. Somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, this is the end of the of the first part. Uh, so this was the the celebration of the, of this year, and it was somehow incredible how I felt in love with the work and then we, we found a way to spread it and promote it uh, and in Italy there's a lot of people interested in Violet of Flanders work. Uh, Windows for Children is a, a very well-known book and uh, people are hungry to, to learn. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very glad about uh, the fact we had the possibility to do it and uh, for me, it was very useful because I could learn with you, which I'm very grateful to. Okay, this is for the celebration part. Um, and now I will uh, talk about uh, what in my experience is uh, working with loss and grief uh, in a Gestalt way. So, um, maybe you, uh, you read the, in, the, in the abstract that I think that loss is not an appropriate word to, to talk about loss. <laughs> um, if you think about it, 
um, uh, we, we use loss and grief words uh, when we uh, think about uh, losing someone or losing a relationship. Uh, we can uh, um, talk about uh, uh, losing something that is an object. I can lose the car key. But when I lose, when I move from one place to another, or when uh, one person I love dies, uh, or uh, even uh, if I am a child, when I lose a transitional object, it's not about an object. It's about uh, relationships, it's about someone I, I love and I care to. So uh, it's not possible, we know, theoretically, it's not possible to lose anything, because we can process persons and possess the car keys, but uh, my wife is not mine, okay? So I just can share with her uh, a piece of, uh, of road, but I can't lose her properly. But we usually talk about loss as loss. Why? Uh, because uh, um, we need uh, to do two, th two things, especially children. We have object, objectivation, sorry. So we need to put a label on, uh, on uh, phenomena and we need to uh, experience control. We need to know that one person is one person even if uh, he or she is always uh, changing. We need to separate when we are very young ourselves from the rest of the world. This is a very early stage. Okay. We need to uh, find the causes and effects that seems to be uh, controllable somehow. So this is one reason why we uh, think about uh, persons as objects. And when we lose something we love, we don't think spontaneously about the presence we have during the relationship. But we think at what we lose. In children, there's another part. Uh, that regards attachment. When we attach to someone, and I don't think, I, I call cheap Buddhism uh, when someone talks uh, about attachment as a uh, use of me. When you are enlightened, you don't need attachment. I don't think so. I think uh, attachment uh, is uh, a biological needing that we all have. But the difference, of course, is that children must attach to one person specifically, which is constant during time. We know from kids experiments, for example, that if uh, a child doesn't have a specific person that take care of him, then he dies some, sometimes. So, uh, attachment <coughs> is meaning, and the only difference between ch uh, children and adults' attachment is that we can attach to more than one beloved object. So we can switch from one to another, or at least we can switch easily, okay? So this is important, because uh, I think that uh, you, you talk, I remember, about the fact that in the US uh, uh, you are focused about solving problems, uh, and uh, loss is not a problem, it's not a pathology. It's something that uh, everybody must deal with. Okay, it's more a kind of an existential problem. So I, I wrote a book about it, about uh, the role of magical thinking in it. Uh, and it came from a session really, from a session with a young woman, not with a kid. Uh, she said these two sentences. She said that she mm, uh, suffered a lot because her, her dad died after a five uh, years terminal illness. And uh, it was very difficult for her to cope with grief. And in one session, she said uh, about the, the fact that he was dying. In, he died in this way. It's not possible. It's not fair. I don't believe it. Which uh, you know, the, uh, there are sentences that we we all use, but they are no logical. Uh, it's not possible. It's happening, so it's possible. I don't believe it. It's not me that I. Uh, it's not about me. But the, the things in the world happens without my permission. I mean, it's not fair, and I don't think that uh, is uh, has uh, nothing to do with justice. If you if you 
go to a hospital, uh, oncological, pediatric hospital, it's immediately clear. It's, it's not, it, it does not have to do with justice. So why do we use uh, these sentences? Why? One thing I noticed that uh, uh, we have a uh, huge amount of anguish about the basic facts of life. Think about the basic instincts that we have when we come to this world. One, very simple, very basic. One is uh, uh, seeking for pleasure. Okay? And what does life uh, respond to this? Usually frustration. I mean, sometimes desires are fulfilled, but we desire faster than, uh, we, than the number of desires we can fulfill. So frustration is integrated in our life. It's not avoidable in any way. Second thing is avoiding pain. And pain is not avoiding. E even from, from the start, from uh, the day we were born, it's pain. Uh, I see people. <laughs> women. <laughs> Just <laughs> <laughs> a third thing is uh, looking for um, some kind of constancy, some kind uh, of security. Uh, from Piaget's studies uh, and then on and on, we know that we look again for causes and effects uh, for um, a world that is somehow predictable and, and we can have control of it. And uh, once again, uh, one one thing that we know for sure about the world is that it, it's always changing, so we cannot all, uh, control almost anything. So, it's a little anguish to manage, right? Okay, and think about uh, a child who's developing and who's managing it and who's uh, uh, somehow building uh, structures to understand the world. Uh, it begin to, uh, to, to do it with uh, some form of magical thinking. Uh, so for example, I might be angry with my mother and uh, my mother got sick, I, for example, just an headache and uh, uh, I can feel guilty for the headache of my mother because I think that my thoughts may cause uh, the, the headache. Okay. Uh, this is not different from adults, really. We have a lot of things uh, in our society that are based on a magical thinking. For example, justice. Justice is a matter of, uh, of laws, not a matter of the <laughs> universe. Um, uh, one other thing I often use as an example is the exceptional selling of the secret by Rosa Pierre that maybe you know. <laughs> yeah. That says basically that if I desire very strong a Mercedes, <laughs> then the universe will bring Mercedes outside my home. <laughs> or if I desire a cappuccino, then the universe <laughs> will. But, but I must desire it very strong. <laughs> Uh, one, uh, one little experience that I, I do when I present uh, this thing about uh, magical thinking is that I ask people, I, 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 will, I, I want you to do it, please, very brief. Uh, think about someone you love very much. Give me a sign. Okay. Then uh, wish for him or for her a terrible disease. <laughs> no one is doing it. Why? Because we think that it's going to happen. That's true. And if uh, this is the case, uh, in Italy we will have no more political alive, I promise you. <laughs> It's not working like that, of course, you know. So, um, it doesn't work here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, why am I talking to you about that? Because I think that, especially in loss and grief, but not only in loss and grief, uh, this thing about magical thinking, we, we must uh, be very aware of it while working with loss. Why? Um, 
imagine that we have uh, two kind uh, of uh, crying, two kind of uh, suffering about something or someone we lose. And uh, in my experience, the first is uh, uh, protest cry. Mm -hmm. Protest. And I saw in the woman, I told you uh, before, when someone died and we imagine uh, that we are still talking with him, or when we use, uh, we always use a metaphorical expression about that, he's gone, uh, leave us, uh, we don't speak directly about death. Why? Because we avoid part of the pain, uh, imagining that the person is still with us, which is not a bad thing in general, of course. But it's bad when it leads to a pain that doesn't have a relief. Imagine for a, for a minute that you, you are with your daughter or with your son and you pass a, a, a toy store and he wants a toy, desperately, and you say no, doesn't matter why. Then he starts to get mad and maybe he starts to cry, it depends. And this crying it has something particular. At that uh, made this crime, it can last uh, very long, forever. <laughs> uh, it has a purpose, a goal. I'm angry and I cry, but I cry because I want it. I, 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 don't, I can't accept that you are saying that you're not buying it to me. Do you have that experience mm -hmm. with it? Yeah. It's very clear for me, I worked in preschool for, for years. Uh, and for example, when children come to preschool and they are getting used to stay without mother for a few hours, so some, some, it is difficult, and they protest, and they are rigid physically somehow. Then, when I say, no, I'm not going to, to buy this toy for you, maybe the, children realize, the child realizes that he's not going to have the toy, really. And then what happened? Less suffering, more suffering? Usually more suffering. It's real desperation. I'm not going to have it. Okay? The difference is, in my experience, that with protest you can go on forever. It's 